Welcome to Afrocentric Pedagogy, hosted by Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branch Ed, as we like to call ourselves. My name is Kim Igwe, and I am the Professional Learning Associate here at Branch Ed. Thanks for joining us today. We are honored to have each of you here today. I know you're eager to hear from Mr. Sharif el Meki, so we're going to get started here quickly after my three-minute brief introduction. Um, I'll briefly share the mission of Branch Ed. It's our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representations of teacher of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the seventh webinar in our 2021-2022 webinar series on innovative pedagogies. The intention behind this series is to inspire us all to think about educational practice through lenses which center and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. Each webinar features a pedagogical expert. Our hope is that you walk away with an invigorated teaching philosophy and strategies that revolutionize your practice. Today's webinar is on Afrocentric pedagogy. Our next and last webinar of this series will feature a panel of currently enrolled teacher candidates and MSI faculty who will share their authentic reaction to the series. This webinar will take place on May 4th and more details at the, come at the end, will come at, to, to the, at the end of today's webinar. Before handing it over to Mr. Elmeki, let me briefly introduce him. Sharif Elmeki is the founder and CEO for the Center for Black Educator Development. The center exists to ensure there will be equity in the recruiting, training, hiring, and retention of quality educators that reflect the cultural backgrounds and share common socio-political interests of the students they serve. Prior to founding the center, El Meki served as a nationally recognized principal and U.S. Department of Educational Principal Ambassador Fellow. His school, Mastery Charter Shoemaker, was recognized by President Obama and Oprah Winfrey and was awarded the prestigious Epic Award for three consecutive years as being amongst the top three schools in the country for accelerating students' achievement levels. We're so excited to have you here today, Mr. El Meki. I know many of you are eager to engage with Mr. Omeki. Please note there will be time for questions and answers at the end of today's presentation. If you have questions as Mr. Omeki is presenting, please use the chat to put them there and we'll have time at the end for him to answer those questions. Welcome, thank you. I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Omeki. Thank you so much. It is so um, great to be here. I've been looking forward to uh, this conversation. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your work at the Branch Ed Alliance. And so uh, really grateful to, uh, to participate in community uh, with you all. Um, I don't take it for granted when I'm invited into communities. And so I wanna, um, wanna just make sure everybody can see. Um, hopefully you can see this because everybody's, uh, disappear. So um, I, I want to start off like really, uh, you know, frame if we were in person, I would ask the elders to, uh, you know, to grant permission for me to begin. Um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and start but really grounding uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, I went to an Afrocentric school as an elementary school student. It was a pre K to sixth grade school called Nathan Sasa in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. And every month we had to do a book report and usually they were on um, I tended to use biographies and imagine, you know, uh, first to sixth grade every month, a book report uh, and a, a biography and often of, of black heroes. That was part of this is in addition to anything we read in history or uh, uh, literature classes. Um, but, you know, Frederick Douglass talks about, you know, the, the need to be far more assertive, to be uh, you know, have a North Star that's unwavering, to have spines that are steeled, 
um, to have spirits that are emboldened and how comfort uh, and, and uh, a desire and an addiction to incrementalism is, uh, you know, unfortunately, very popular and can get in the way of, of ch radical change, uh, the radical change that our children, our communities, and we all as human beings deserve, um, because we know there are a lot of uh, institutionalized injustices. I'm also just going to apologize. I'm in an airport, so you may hear announcements in the background. I could not find a, a room with a door uh, <laughs> on it besides the bathroom. <laughs> Uh, and so Frederick Douglass also, he, he asked, he was on his deathbed and someone uh, came to him, you know, and so you, as you can see, he's like one of my heroes um, that I just studied a lot um, in my childhood and, and later, but he, he was asked on his deathbed by a young black man, what advice would you give to a person who's trying to continue the effort? He said, Frederick Douglass, you are a national hero You've done so much work for justice. What can what can I do? What can we do? And I'll get to the answer that Frederick Douglass gave him um, in a little bit. I want to keep that decentralizing question of, you know, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to fight for justice? And just want to share a little background again. Um, Nitha Musasa, uh, as my elementary school, was not. I was not even. Uh, interested, never even dawned on me to become a teacher in elementary, middle, high school, or in college. It wasn't until after college when someone approached me and, and said, hey, you know, you should consider teaching. And I told him originally, like, I, I wasn't interested, uh, but I went to the interest meeting anyway. And there I met a, a Black man, veteran educator in the school district of Philadelphia, and he talked about you know what, I see the activism that you wanna get involved with. Well, I was on my way to law school. And he said, but the purest form of activism is teaching black children well. And that not only resonated with, with me, but it f has fueled me for, the, for almost 30 years now, um, once I became an educator. Uh, this young man that I'm standing with is Terrence Williams, who is also an educator um, now. And uh, he was just hired to be an assistant principal next year. Um, after uh, over a decade of, of teaching. And so when we're talking about uh, curriculum, Afrocentricity um, and, and pedagogical frameworks, how we begin is this idea that it's not just who's leading the classrooms, it's not just who prepared them to lead the classroom, it's also the ecosystem and particularly a uh, curriculum and pedagogical frameworks and historical lens that informs and feeds how we plan our units, our lessons, our assessments, our relationship building. It's all of this, it's the ecosystem. And so when we look at a, a, a teacher that's not only well-prepared, but well-versed in the communities that they serve in, that they have not just been prepared to work in a system, which schools are, right? And so some people are prepared to work in a system there are other people who are prepared to work in communities. And that I think is, is, the, is, the, is the work. When you're prepared to work in a community, you're not just saying like, oh, how am I thinking about this lesson with this limited knowledge? You know, people talk about content knowledge. It also has to be community knowledge, not just deep content knowledge, deep curriculum knowledge. It has to be deep community knowledge, which then informs the curriculum and the content. And so when we see students who, and everyone is familiar with the windows and mirrors theory, but this idea that, again, it's not just who's leading the classroom, but it's what's in the curriculum. How are uh, people of African descent centered? How is their story? Uh, when Dr. Greg Carr and several others uh, wrote uh, the curriculum, uh, African-American uh, curriculum, Afrocentric curriculum for the school district of Philadelphia, which is still in the basement somewhere. Um, they, it was never implemented um, fully, uh, even though you know, for high school graduation in Philadelphia, most students have to take the uh, uh, African-American history course, uh, but the curriculum itself was expended beyond just one year in high school. It was a curriculum that extended you know, from uh, K to 12, and it was never fully uh, implemented. But one of the things that they were looking at was just how are 
African people centered in whatever class, not just history class, not just literature class, but in all classes, how were African um, people of African descent, how were they centered? How were their contributions centered? How did they look at themselves? How did others look at them? How did they uh, view themselves in the future? What was their relationship to teaching and learning? And at the Center for Black Educated Development, we are trying to codify and use all of that as part of our teacher preparation program. Because in considering when we think about teaching and learning, and we know that how illegal it was and how yesterday and how underfunded and disrupted it is today, we know that we have to look outside of just what's happening in this country and this particular history and look at a longer version, a longer vision of how, what was the relationship between teaching and learning in communities uh, before. And so when we're talking about this pedagogical framework, when we're talking about this intellectual genealogy, I think it's absolutely critical that we start paying closer attention to not only who's leading the classroom, but as I mentioned, who prepared them to lead the classroom. And so when we start studying our intellectual genealogy and start realizing, okay, this is where, this is why, and it takes reflection, right? It takes, this is why I've come to this conclusion, or here's the biases that I might need to unsurface. Uh, and and I, I wanna, you know, I, I rarely uh, speak about my journey without bringing up Miss Yvonne Savior, uh, who was my instructional coach. Uh, Yvonne Savior was one of the few black women to win Pennsylvania's uh, state teacher of the year. Um, and I had this, this, this tremendous blessing to be coached um, by her, not only as a new teacher, but later on, um, she became a principal coach right around the time when I became a principal. So I benefited from her, her wisdom, her, her intellectual genealogy, her, uh, you know, uh, African-centered uh, uh, framework, pedagogical framework um, in my journey as a, as a teacher. So not only did I have this poured into me in elementary school, uh, but later when I became an educator, it was reconnected, you know, um, and the things that were seeded in me as a youth she was able to draw it and, and help it flourish as a professional. And I, and I often think, you know, um, when we're talking about this pedagogy, uh, African-centered pedagogy, again, what's the intellectual genealogy? What is the line to help this narration, these lessons, the curriculum, the learnings pass from generation to generation, from teacher to student, student to teacher, student to student, teacher to teacher, et cetera. And what would it look like if we all had the coaches uh, of Branch Alliance, people like Yvonne Savior, and centering, here's what African people contributed. And no, their history did not start with enslavement. That does not encompass their history. That there was a blip in their history, but their history is much, much longer than that. And it can be drawn from and centered so that students, when we're talking about connecting to real world, connecting, teaching truth, uh, being able uh, to do that. We know as, as uh, that our children across this country um, are struggling in many of our schools. And it's not just in the, in the schools themselves as, as students, Many also become educators and remember the triggering experiences that they had as students. And then they're experiencing triggering situations from colleagues and supervisors as people of color um, who are professionals within the schools. And so we all have this commitment to, to make the changes uh, as Dr. Uh, Angela Davis uh, reminds us. And so when we're talking about like, this uh, pedagogy, part of it is just how are people being prepared? And so recently Temple, a couple of years ago, Temple University did a study 2018 and the results were not new because they also mirrored other studies that spoke about the preparation of teachers. And this is why your work is so important. When, and these are students who've come through uh, traditional programs um, across Pennsylvania. And when you see it, we're saying like, 
you know, and, and I spoke, I had the opportunity to even speak to the researchers, even the question, the second question about unmotivated students. And I really had to push back on them about the, the language that they use to describe students, because it could very well be that students are not unmotivated to, to learn. They may be unmotivated by what the person is teaching. They may be um, demotivated by racial biases and experiences that they're having within the, uh, within the schools, within the classrooms. And so, but for 72% of teachers uh, who were surveyed to say that they were unprepared to teach after multiple years, four or five years, maybe tens of thousands of dollars invested um, in tuition payments and, and other expenses, only to come out and say, I'm not prepared to teach. I'm not prepared to deliver instruction, period, let alone to culturally diverse students. And so as we're speaking about African-centered pedagogy, we also have to understand that that's not a, a separate uh, thing because some people think like, oh, I'll learn all of this and then I'll just add a, a little pinch of African-centered pedagogy. No, 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 that pedagogy has to be centered in the training, development, mentorship, and collective accountability of, of how we prepare ourselves to be educators, how we lead our classrooms, how we lead our schools and systems. And so when, it, uh, when we're talking about uh, African pedagogy, when we're talking about like this pedagogical framework that centers uh, black children uh, from the diaspora, we have to understand that there are many people who want to discount that. While we know that a positive racial identity is a must for a student to, uh, to learn, we know that a sense of belongingness is a must for students to achieve. And we know that the, the right pedagogical frameworks uh, can help bolster uh, both of those uh, initiatives. And we also recognize that there are, are many who ignore that, who feel like that is not as important. Um, that they don't have to, uh, to understand the communities as long as they know how to work in a system. Centering these students is, is important. And when Malcolm X at, used to ask people, who taught you to hate yourself? Unfortunately, too many students can say my school did, my experiences in, in my classroom did, uh, the learnings that did not include me, that I was written in as a footnote, if anything. And it's not just black students who would benefit from this. Because we also talk about when we're that windows and mirrors. If a white student who's sitting next to the black child and never sees any contributions of, of black children or of African people, that their history started with enslavement, that the way that they are written about or erased is always uh, you know, problematic and oppressive. As a child, and they're hearing this for 180 plus days a year, for 13 years, what does it do to their psyche? What does it do to their understanding of the world, of uh, people of color? What does it do to construct and calcify biases that they may have, that they may not even be aware of, simply from the pedagogical frameworks and the historical lens and the racial biases of the people leading classroom schools and systems that both of these children, both the white child as well as this uh, uh, African descendant uh, child sitting next to each other. How does all of that come together to create a culture in a school, to create frameworks, um, both conscious and unconscious frameworks of students who grow on to become adults and some may become educators perpetuating the very cycle that they experience as students. And so when we think about what is the true purpose of education and we say, oh yes, it's not where we are now is not where we deserve to be. Where we are now is not where our students and children and, their, and our grand students, as I call them, where they would deserve to be. But do we have the courage to do things as radical enough. When that man asked Frederick Douglass, what should we do to ensure justice, educational justice, which can't be separated from racial justice. And with that means that they're, how we talk about people, 
how we talk about history, what we own in our contributions to history now is absolutely critical. My friend, Amir Suleiman, my favorite poet, look him up if you haven't seen him, Amir Suleiman, and you can find this, some of his poetry on YouTube. He says, we're all gonna be ancestors one day and act accordingly. How are we acting accordingly? And we know with full certainty, we will be an ancestor one day. And how are we teaching today's children that will impact our grand students later? And so for, for me, part of uh, African-centered framework is about teaching truth. It's about expanding beyond a, a white supremacist lens of what the world is, what a worldview is, uh, what history is, what current events are. And as James Baldwin used to remind us, history is never in the past. History is now. And to think otherwise is oppressive. With that type of framing, then we can't help but to explore, dissect, understand, and constantly reflect of where are we centering an African-centered pedagogy, particularly when we're uh, speaking about uh, and teaching Black students and then Black communities, but also if we're teaching anywhere, because we know that there's so many lies and, and um, and mistruths that are taught in our curriculum that are uh, that have been just uh, taught and retaught and regurgitated without proper probing. And without that, we'll be stuck in the same cycle. And so the idea of courage or complacency, you know, um, being complicit or committed, and what that all means as we as we move forward, as we center and so as we push to find out whose voices are centered and whose voices are missing, whose perspective and experiences are centered and whose are missing. If we have, if we use that as like kind of the, the framework as whatever it is that we're teaching, I'm we'll saying whose voices, experiences and perspectives are centered and whose are missing. If our students, no matter what grade they are, no matter what subject they're, they're taking in, if those are the questions that are, are internalized, then they will always uh, have with them tools that will support critical thinking and will question what's being, what's being taught. It will be questioned what's being said. It will be questioned what is, is, is placed on the news media or anything else that they may consume where they have a filter to ask, is this accurate and where does it come from? And they will likely be able to start tracing where it came from and so much of it was not centering African people but it was centering white supremacist thoughts you know uh, a friend of mine talks about that you know often when the, all the laws and institutions um, were formed together to ensure that uh, people of African descent were not giving uh, treatment as human beings. And what they said was like, we're, we don't have to def, uh, prove our humanity, but we will defend it. They already knew that we uh, black people were human beings because that's why they created laws for it. They did not create laws to stop, you know, uh, farm animals from, from learning, from reading. No, they knew very well that these are human beings and we have to create systems to ensure that they are never able to uh, enjoy full humanity and citizenship. And I challenge people, when did that stop? Where, where's the marker that this delineating line that stopped and things uh, changed and that child was now this full citizen, their parent was now a full citizen, that community member who loved these students and send them to us, some of them under duress, sending them to us. Uh, when was justice ever met? And no one uh, would be able to, sh to share, like, here's the line that this magically occurred. Um, and so we have to use our activism and be uh, grounded in educational activism, because that's what I think it, it will take in order to ensure that the curriculum and the content matches the needs of the communities and the children that centers 
community and children and their contributions over generations into whatever field it is that we are um, uh, teaching about, students are learning about, exploring, any of that has to center the humanity of, of other human beings. Um, and that is not the default. And so when things are not the default, it is the status quo. That means we have to be vigilant, ongoing vigilance to ensure that our students don't suffer from the same, same issues. So this change, which includes centering uh, uh, African pedagogical framework, uh, African uh, and Black historical lens added into the mix, not as a, a one-off, but grounded in the, the preparation of educators and not just teachers, principals, superintendents, school board members, all of these, uh, these, these groups of educators um, have to be part of the learning circle, has to be part of the, the reimagining what it means to actually be prepared to teach children, to lead children. And that, that's gonna take a, a, a radical framework, um, but it's also as radical in one terms, but it's also natural in another. It's natural to, to want to, it should be natural, I should say, uh, to want to know deeply about the communities that are, we claim we're serving. Um, it should not be like this, uh, this unnatural uh, event or phenomena, but it truly is. And that is why it is uh, at this point radical. So this is one of my favorite quotes. I kept it um, throughout my career on my wall to remind myself as an educator, what was my duty? What was my commitment? What was my challenge? And what was the accountability system for me? That I was making a choice every single day, how I was leading and how people were experiencing my leadership and asking them, what should I start? What should I stop? What should I continue? And getting that insight getting this feedback about how am I presenting about people. This is grounded in African pedagogical framework. This is grounded in um, Afrocentricity. This is asking, how are you experiencing my leadership? And so even you know, a lot of times when people think about African pedagogy, they're thinking very specifically about curriculum, very specifically about history, uh, but it's also a mindset, it's a framing. It's how do I make sure that we are a community? Because what grounds and the relationship between teaching and learning and community was that everyone is learning from each other. That's hard to do if you're not part of the feedback loop. If it's more of a linear approach, if it's more of a hierarchical approach, then it is I'm the boss and you are the child. I, my position here is based on power, not this collective community. So our African pedagogical framework is about building relationships. And so when we think of pedagogy, it is not just the curriculum uh, itself. It includes that, absolutely. But it's also a mindset of how, what is the relationship between teaching and learning, student and teacher? And are we learning together? My, my teacher, um, one of the ones at Nathan Musasa, Baba Changa used to say, an African pedagogical framework means that a teacher knows that I will be successful when you are successful as a student and you will be successful when I am successful as a teacher. That is African pedagogy. That is the framing that begins relationships, curriculum writing, assessments, accountability, community. And so if we have that type of understanding that the pedagogy goes beyond the curriculum. What it is, is the, what is the mindset of the person leading a classroom? What do they think about the community? What do they think about Africa and African people and their relationship between teaching and learning? In, um, in African uh, framing, well, let me start here. In Western thought, it is that the, the student or the mentee's job and responsibility is to find their mentor that they have to go and seek their mentor. African pedagogical framework is that the mentor's responsibility is to find their mentees. So it's the teacher's job to find their students and reach them and share with them what, what they have. That's, the, that's a, a, 
an African-centered uh, philosophy of that is, there's a tax on everything and the tax on knowledge is sharing, it, but sharing it in a way where you also recognize that you're learning from the students. And then again, that is the community and it's a different framework and, and learning process uh, of building community, of a healing community and supportive community uh, where it's harder to understand who's the boss. The boss is the learning. The learning is, is what uh, is the supervisor of the situation and causing people to make decisions that improve the outcomes for all, for everyone in the community. So back to Frederick Douglass, when he asked, was asked on his deathbed, what advice would he give to the next generation? What he said was agitate, 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 those three words. And when we think about agitation, sometimes people look at it as outward facing, holy, which it is often. But the biggest part of agitation is within ourselves, our own mindsets. What is the invisible smog that we breathe about African pedagogy? What are the things that they uh, you know, have taught us that we've ingested consciously and unconsciously? Uh, how do we agitate within ourselves to rid ourselves of, of that, to unsurface and deal with uh, and filter the things that we are uh, being exposed to? And so with this agitation, there's a lot of things. And I'm not, I'm not uh, saying we should ignore uh, you know, low-hanging fruit. I think that's important things to build on, but we can't get stuck there. You know, um, there's a, a saying, uh, George Jackson used to say, you know, there's nothing wrong with patience, but patience that goes on too long sometimes can be, actually be cowardice. So we have to make sure that we're constantly reflecting this, this is a, a thing about patience and patience meaning like we're praying and rowing. My mother used to say like, if you're stuck in a boat, you can sit there and pray for some wind or you can pray and row. So that's the type of patience uh, we're talking about, not passive patience that, that does nothing, that's not thinking uh, with intellectual rigor and commitment. Um, and we, so we can't get stuck here. Uh, and we also have to know that systemic change, sustainable change is, is much, much harder. And we have to do it in community we have to do it with a commitment and a level of zeal. Uh, and we have to also do it with patience and grace, uh, but patient and grace that's not oppressive, patient and grace that's not passive, but it is an active uh, source. And so to, to begin uh, wrapping up, what I, one of the things that we often spoke about in um, both as a principal uh, leading a school and now leading a a small organization trying to uh, recreate a national black teacher pipeline um, where we're working with black high school students, black college youth to explore teaching um, as paid apprentices where they learn how to teach and they do teach it first, second and third graders using an Afrocentric uh, pedagogy. They focus on literacy, positive racial identity development and some type of educational activism project that we're all committed to and, and learning as a you know, organization wide. Well, part of it is, you know, we're, we have these competencies that we believe that every educator um, should have when they're teaching any children and particularly uh, children of color. And the, the questions that we walk through, and again, imagine a ninth grader grappling with these type of questions um, as they go through their apprenticeships uh, after school or in the summer uh, or in, in our high school teacher academy where they take an elective about teaching 101, uh, which is grounded in black pedagogical frameworks and a black historical lens. As you all know, many educators as they're developed, they learn about white educational theorists, European, white American uh, behavior theorists, child psychologists, um, John Dewey, B.F. Skinner, Horace Mann, P.S.J. Uh, but they don't learn about African-centered educational theorists, African-centered behavior theorists, child psychologists. And so again, it's not just a curriculum, it's the framing that we start from that makes up and encapsulates African pedagogy. And so it challenged all of us to look and see what did Lucy Craft Laney say about teaching? 
black children. What did Dr. Carter G. Woodson say? What, what got him fired from Howard University? Uh, what about how he was training teachers got him removed from an HBCU? Those are the things that we uh, want to dive into. But we ask our ninth grade, imagine a ninth grader asking themselves, how does my first grader, my first grade student experience my leadership? And how do I know? And how often do I know? Am I asking once in the beginning of the year or the beginning of the summer, their, their apprenticeship? Or is it something that I'm finding out and getting feedback? Uh, we talk about checking for understanding. I suppose we check for our own understanding about how people, our students are experiencing our leadership. They think about, okay, what's an additional anti-racist stance that we'll, I'll practice? As many of our students are going from summer to summer, from after school program to after school program, these are some of the things that they're thinking about. What's one additional thing that I can add to my toolkit, my anti-racist toolkit, not just my classroom management toolkit, no, my relationship building toolkit, my African-centered pedagogical framing uh, toolkit, auditing their classrooms, our classrooms, what additional mirrors will we create? What additional mirrors? How, how else do we create a sense of belongingness, a better understanding of African contributions to the world, to civilization? Currently, traditionally, historically, what's one additional mirror that I can add that I hadn't necessarily thought of? A part of African pedagogy is also training our replacements. Again, I was not approached to become a teacher until I was I graduated from college. Many of my friends, we started an organization, the Fellowship Black Male Educators for Social Justice. Um, I hope that you all are able to come to our Black Male Educator convening this, this fall um, in October. We'll be sure to send, um, send the information out. Uh, where we center the black man's experience in education in, uh, in America. Um, as many of you know, public school teachers, only less than 2% of them identify as black men. And it ended up being 17 of us who launched this organization. And what we recognize, not a single one of us, 17 black men from all over the country, we're all in education and finding success and leading our classrooms and schools. None of us have been approached and invited into the profession until we have graduated from college. First thing we did was ask our colleagues, most of them were white women. The average response was third grade. Third grade was when they remembered an adult engaging them in a conversation about them becoming a teacher, about them leading a classroom. Close back for one group, third average third grade for another group. And so when we ask ourselves, training our replacement, that is also uh, an African framework of train your replacement, of the mentor finding the mentee, of again, building community through learning. This idea of learning from the cradle to the grave and what that means in some societies, but what, how is that reinforced uh, uh, here in our schools? And it's constant, how will we agitate for change as, as Frederick Douglass uh, you know, uh, told us to, reminded us. So what can we change? What's within our locus of control, within our school to center an African experience, African pedagogical framework, uh, African-centered lens, historical lens uh, to the teaching, to the learning, and doing it within community of each other. So with that, I remind us that if we are gonna be the storm and the earthquake against racial injustice, then we have to agitate, agitate, agitate to ensure that things that have been uh, constant, things that have been uh, assumed and taught and retaught, that we're agitating the change but it starts with our own framing, our own mindsets about African pedagogy, about African people, about the contributions uh, to society, to civilization. But again, the African pedagogical framework is not just a curriculum. 
African pedagogy starts with our mindsets. And so I ask, no matter where you sit, you know, how are you going to uh, move forward? And, and again, it begins with educating ourselves, learning more about Black history and Black pedagogy, and doing the work necessary uh, to recenter uh, things that have been, you know, um, you know, diminished, erased, ignored, or disparaged. So we're going to, um, I believe, open it up. Uh, for questions. Um, I appreciate your time. And again, I hope that uh, it wasn't too loud uh, in the background, Kim, uh, as I was going through the slides. But thanks again for um, inviting me into to your community and into this series. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge um, and wisdom with us. I would now love to open it up for um, some Q&A. So um, participants, if you have some questions you would like to ask Mr. Elmeki, you can put them in the Q&A section or the chat section and we will, um, um, I can share them out and, and um, learn more. Um, as folks are entering them into the chat, my first question is, where can we learn more? Um, what are you reading? What can we read to learn more about an Afrocentric pedagogy? What would you suggest? Yeah, so there's um, one book is called uh, We Are African People. And it is about independent Black schools, um, many of them built in the 60s and 70s, um, and how they built these independent Black schools using uh, this African pedagogical framework um, is absolutely, uh, I think, just critical. Um, I think tying into that as well uh, is fugitive pedagogy uh, that speaks about Dr. Carter G. Woodson's, uh, Dr. Uh, Jarvis Givens uh, recently wrote this and published it last year. Uh, but fugitive pedagogy speaks about Dr. Carter G. Woodson's mindset, his framing, his thinking. Um, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson created uh, Black History uh, Week, Negro History Week, which is now expanded to a month, and him centering it. And one of the things that he would talk about is this isn't created just for you know pageantry, to make nice bulletin boards, to have pretty websites, uh, you know, and brochures. Um, it's not just a celebration; it is a learning opportunity that should really go year round. He had a Negro uh, History Week as the accountability week where students and staff could share, this is what we learn about African people, right? And so we think about that where February, is, you know, I often say, you know, Black History Month is every month, February, we're just the blackest. And right, and so February is really grounded in, this is our accountability time where we are showing the, the level of proficiency I've gained as an educator about African pedagogy. My students are having a better understanding about African pedagogy and contributions. So our mindset accountability is, is February. It should not just be relegated to, oh, this is when we celebrate Rosa Parks, Dr. King, and you know, um, a couple other uh, folks. This is a, a time to show deep reflection. So, I would say uh, those are two, and of course, uh, Vanessa Siddle Walker's uh, work in the, uh, you know, uh, Black, uh, as my friend calls it, a Black teaching tradition, um, which is grounded in how there were African people thinking about teaching and learning. Those are the three, uh, you know, three areas I would start with. Thank you for sharing. Um, we will make sure to include all of those. Um, I know folks are already asking, can you make sure to include those links? We will um, with all of the readings. Um, we have a question around the principles that you share also apply to marginalized groups. Are there readings on pedagogy for Hispanic students? There are, but I, I would, I would want to make sure that I follow up with you and Kim and send those to you. Um, I don't have those memorized. Um, but not only with uh, uh, our Latino uh, students, but also indigenous students. Um, so when we look at ideas like freedom schools, um, indigenous people had treaty schools, very similar where they were holding on to traditions um, and about their learning, about their, uh, you know, their, their, uh, their culture. 
and what that means to preserve it within schools. Because if we look at schools and communities as a singular thing, you know, right now we look at schools and home when essentially in a lot of uh, indigenous and black and brown cultures, that's, that should be, or is expected to be one in the same. Home is the first school. School is just a part of the learning process. It's not the, right? But often when we become institutionalized in, in, in the teaching and learning frameworks that exist, we tell students that the only real learning happens within the institutions things that happen at home and then your community is not really learning. It's supplemental at best, right? And this is why we can tell students, oh, get your education and leave here, you know? Leave who? Leave what? Leave their grandmother? Leave their parents? Not get education and like, what problems do you want to solve? What do you want to help build? What do you want to contribute to? Students are giving messages, oh, leave, right? That's, that's alien to how, how a lot of students are brought up and thinking about their loved ones. But absolutely, um, every culture, and we're talking about African pedagogical uh, frameworks today, but it can apply this uh, healthy mindset about students, period, and humanity of students and their, their uh, community is absolutely the pedagogy that we should be uh, starting with in any circumstance. Um, can you share more about mindsets you've talked a lot about this throughout the presentation and how what advice would you give to a, a new teacher coming into a classroom and digging in to understand the mindsets that they're bringing in about their students um what advice would you give them yeah i mean i think it really it starts with a level of humility you know we, uh, we believe mindset skill and will kind of the three-legged stool um, for effective educators the mindset the skills necessary to be uh, great leaders of a classroom, um, and then the will to push and challenge our own thinking, our own mindset. So it's circular. Um, they're all uh, they're all connected. I think if, if we start with humility and we 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 uh, want to learn and we're curious about who we're teaching and their communities, um, all the research that talks about students connecting learning to real world. For that schema, but we don't even know what their real world is. How are we going to connect it, right? So it's this level of humility. Understand, like I am the lead learner in this classroom, and I am learning and being transparent. Suppose we didn't just put the objectives that we want for students. We didn't just say students will be able to, you know, whatever acronym is used, and say here's what the students will. Suppose in addition to that, we add the objective that we have for ourselves. Here's what I'm learning. Here's what you're teaching me. And suppose we ask them, what should I start, stop, and continue? We start off the year as new teachers and every teacher, right? Like we start off, hey, I will also ask you, how are you experiencing my leadership? Do you see yourself in curriculum? Do you find yourself emboldened and empowered? Uh, do you find yourself uh, with agency? Do you feel supported? If we're asking students and they're asking them, when do they feel the most about this and the least? Suppose we ask those questions, no matter what grade they are, we just change the questions to, to the level of sophistication of the student. But we tell them, this feedback, I am going to follow up with you. And I'm going to ask you in a couple of months, have I gotten it better? Because at the same time, if I'm asking that, and I want truth and honesty from my students in this community, that means I have to build trust, right? So not only am I asking them, because students will know, like, hey, one, you're not really listening. We don't see a change. or I'm, I'm putting myself in harm's way when I give you feedback, right? So it's simultaneously asking the questions and recognizing and telling them, I'm going to work hard to build trust and build community so that I get the most honest answer um, that, that you give. And I'm going to put up what I'm work, what you told me I need to work on. I'm putting that up. This is my objective. And it might not change as rapidly as daily, but it's up there. And students say, and they can give me feedback about that. Like, hey, you said you were working on it. How many of us as educators, you know, uh, show up to school with a new bag or new hairdo and kids recognize it right away? But then we may take a course or join a book club or listen to a podcast and we tell ourselves, I got a whole new outlook. I got a whole new mindset. I got a new attitude, right? And students don't see it. They recognize your new glasses, but they ain't see no new mindset. They haven't experienced a new mindset. 
So let's be even more transparent and say, hey, here's the where I'm working on. And I want you to, to give me feedback about it, right? And so that's one thing. If we just did that and asking students, what should I start doing? What should I stop doing? And what should I continue doing? Imagine how much better we'd grow uh, and how much uh, more students would accelerate in their learning and the outcomes, right? Because who better to know how they experience our leadership than them? But too often we want to tell ourselves how we're actually improving. And that's, that could be some of the, you know, uh, the worst weapon against progress that you have because sometimes we lie to ourselves, consciously or unconsciously. Um, as a former eighth grade teacher, this resonates a lot um, in how we can, we can help prepare new teachers and um, veteran teachers alike. Um, we'll leave uh, one more minute open for the, the question and answer. If anyone has a burning question, you can use the chat to put it in or the Q&A function. Um, give one more moment. And Mr. Amaki, if there's anything else you would like to add before we close out for today, we would love some last um, minute sentiments, um, things to take us out. Yeah, I mean, I would just end with, you know, thank you all for your work. You know, it takes a deep intellectual rigor um, to improve our craft. You know, teaching is one of the hardest, most challenging and most rewarding um, efforts out there. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it is, even if people don't recognize it based off of policies, you know, their mouths say one thing, their policies say something else about this profession. It is, um, it is God's work. You know, uh, every prophet was a teacher, every, uh, you know, and when we think about like just the, the intellectual genealogy that you're contributing to, um, and I would just say, please um, engage students about be that mentor finding their mentee be that teacher who's training their replacements and at least and of course we're going to support our students in whatever it is that they do but please at least engage uh, students about this idea of leading classrooms uh, we know the impact that it has but too often what we share with students are the hardships um, but not the other pieces um, there is no more um, impactful um, you know, thing than, than teaching and teaching well. And uh, as as uh, Dr. Martin Ryder told me, the purest form of activism is teaching black children well, is, is teaching any children well. Um, so, you know, I encourage you to continue on that, on that path and journey. And we'll never arrive, right? Like, a, you know, we should stay away from this idea of perfectionism, but always strive for, for excellence. And with that, we need feedback. So continue to um, doing the work, continue to solicit feedback and continue to build communities like this um, so that we can learn um, together. And sometimes we have to learn publicly in settings together. Um, and I just encourage myself and you all to um, continue to do that. And thanks again for having me. Really, um, you know, grateful. Thank you so much for being here, for sharing your work with us um, and for giving us food for thought as we continue to continue the work. Um, we will, everyone is very um, eager to, to get your references. So we will make sure to send those out. Um, and um, this will be posted on our website so people can go back and reference it. In oh, yeah, you know, and I'll add just two things. My team would kill me if we didn't. If you know any uh, black high school or college youth um, who are interested, and I would say uh, brown indigenous as well, but you know, uh, but what they'll be learning is a black pedagogical framework. Um, and we've had Asians and Latino students who joined us because they're like, I will not learn this in my um, undergrad, or I'm not learning this in, in my teacher academy in high school. Um, but if you know of them, we are uh, hiring right now for paid apprenticeships um, where they teach first, second, and third graders this summer. Um, so if you know anyone, uh, please let us know. And we're also looking for a couple of coaches uh, to support these uh, Black teacher apprentices as we build a Black teacher pipeline. And then also please follow the hashtag, we need Black teachers. Um, contribute to that, share that with students. Uh, we're looking for people to give testimonies, create videos um, on whatever social media platform. So um, you can find, and I guess, Kim, if you can just share our website, um, the Academies tab have the... Uh, the applications for the apprentices as well as the coaches. So um, thank you.
we will be sure to share all of um, the goodies, all of the opportunities um, and upcoming events, the conference you mentioned and such and all the good reads. So y'all have a lot out there. All of our oh, viewers fun. have a lot out there um, to, to read, watch and do in the next, next um, upcoming months and weeks ahead. Our next webinar is May 4th. It's at 12 p.m. Central, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the last webinar of this series will feature a panel of currently enrolled teacher candidates and MSI faculty who will share their authentic reactions to this series. You can um, sign up for that using the QR code on the screen or using the chat. Um, you'll see a link in there if you would like to sign up to come. We would love to see you there. Um, and again, that will be on May 4th at 12 p.m. Central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, lastly, we would love to, before we sign off, we would love to hear about your experience today by taking a brief poll. You should see that pop up on your screen. And of course, um, we just thank you for your time, Mr. Omeki, and sharing um, everything that you are doing out there and your resources and the opportunities um, that you're offering um, students. So thank you so much. We appreciate everyone for coming and listening 